Hello, my name is Ross Goodman. I'm Vice Chair of the Florida Bar Standing Committee on Professionalism. Today is April 24th, the year 2000, and I am honored and privileged to be interviewing uh, today Judge Lacey Collier of the U.S. District Court, Northern District of Florida. Good afternoon, Judge Collier. Ross. How are you? Great. Good. Uh, you've got a fascinating history uh, in that you're not the classical lawyer to judge route by any stretch of the imagination uh, in terms of what you did before you became a lawyer. So can you tell a little bit about your background in history? Well, I'm from Alabama and always had the uh, boyhood dream to fly jet airplanes. And so that's what I set out to do in the very beginning. Went to two years of college at the University of Alabama just for the purpose of getting into the Navy flight training program. And then I came to Pensacola in 1955 as a flight student. Claimed at home ever since, but I wasn't here that much because I spent nearly 21 years in the, in the Navy as a, a naval aviator. Landing those fast and heavy airplanes on those small uh, moving objects in the dead of night? Well, obviously with a little bit of success since I'm still here. <laughs> obviously. Uh, so you were 20 plus years in the Navy. Yep. And retired at what rank? Lieutenant Commander. All right, and you had not been in law school or studied law up until that time? Well, actually, uh, in growing up at home, my father was a doctor. Many of his friends were lawyers. And one of my mother's dear friends was the dean of the Alabama Law School. And so I grew up kind of with that in the background. And uh, certainly those were people that I respected greatly. Everyone did uh, in, in those days. And I was led to think that that was just, you know, the heights. And uh, although I never uh, at that time aspired to that, I suspect if I had uh, stayed in college, that's probably what I would have done then. And in addition, I think I had been in the Navy a short while and uh, married, I know, for two weeks. And I got sent away to Naval Justice School in Newport, Rhode Island. And in the service, I served as legal officer in different places, trial counsel. Back then, you didn't have to be an attorney to be a military uh, trial counsel. So I served both as a prosecutor, I guess you'd call it, and, uh, and the defense attorney as well. And then served on special court marshals uh, as a member and as president. So I had a little touch with it even in the, in the military. Now your full time job was flying jets and airplanes. And this was something that you did on occasion when called upon? Well, uh, it's, it's I don't, not I'm, where the, the, the Navy considers you to be a naval officer first. And the flying is a collateral assignment. Okay. And therefore, uh, in one sense of the word, the purists would say that my job was whatever assignment I had as division officer or legal officer or what, and then, then go flying. Now, did that experience as legal officer uh, influence your decision to go into law when you retired from the Navy? No, not really. <laughs> then why? It's, it's, it's strange. Uh, actually, when, when, when the time in the Navy reached the point where I most likely would be flying a desk instead of flying an airplane, after you reach 40-ish thereabouts, then I just decided that that was my time and you know I thoroughly enjoyed it, wouldn't swap a day of it but it was time to move on to other things. And uh, uh, in, in looking around, clearly the law was in my, my sights, uh, but not uh, again. I guess I, I had such respect for it, I never figured I could be a part of it. So what, what motivated you to, to go to law school then? Well, I ended up taking the LSAT and uh, scored reasonably well so that I felt I could have some assurance of getting into a law school. Other than that, I couldn't have resigned from my paying job in the Navy. And so when that happened, I did uh, uh, decide sort of by default that this is what I really wanted to do. Uh, and, and thank goodness the opportunity was, uh, was there for me. And I guess uh, maybe, maybe you don't admit it until you know you have it uh, in focus 
because perhaps you don't want to be disappointed or what. But uh, after I was accepted, then I was just enthusiastic uh, about it. Now, you went to Florida State Law School. Right. And your philosophy of being a law student uh, was kind of different from your peers, was it not? Well, it sure was, uh, to do with age as well as my family stayed here in Pensacola, which is about 200 miles away. And back then, before the interstate, that was pretty much a journey. And uh, so Bev and the kids, for the most part, would come over one weekend. I might come home the next weekend, uh, vice versa. We met in the middle uh, several times. And uh, so I really didn't get involved in the law school um, uh, social aspects of it or whatever. I always jokingly said my idea was to get, get through law school without anybody ever knowing I was there. And um, maybe I achieved that in, in one sense, that I wasn't an overachiever or I guess an underachiever, so I didn't attract any special attention. What was your most memorable experience in law school? Yeah. Keep going. I'm just going to fix this. There we go. Yeah. Yes? Same question. <laughs> what? <laughs> I remember the question. I'm just sitting here thinking about the uh, joking before about Judge Hubler's tape. <clears throat> what was your most memorable experience in law school? Oh, I don't know that there was anything particularly me memorable. Some of the, uh, the classes I related to more than others. Uh, certainly my interest was in trial practice, the courtroom. And uh, those courses that were aimed at that sort of like evidence, trial practice and such were the most memorable and meaningful ones to me uh, personally. I'm not sure there was any particular single event that I could uh, uh, cite to you other than uh, receiving the final approval for graduation. <laughs> were, were there any, uh, any people at the school who were particularly inspirational to you? Oh yes, yes, a lot, and some are, are dear friends even to today. I, uh, no one can go through Florida State without uh, mentioning Charles Earhart, who uh, I consider still, and I hope he does, a very good friend uh, to this day. We, we still talk on occasion and uh, seek his advice. Um, but it, you can't do any better than study under the man who wrote the book, and he literally wrote the evidence code for of Florida. Now is there anything about Professor Earhart that you found inspiring besides his obvious command of, uh, of the law and the laws of evidence? Absolute enthusiasm for the law and, and the rules of evidence. And uh, it brings them alive as not just a, uh, a book, printed page, just learn this rule, learn the next rule, but what it means, uh, what its purpose is. That was always important and became more important to me as a judge because uh, uh, if, if the purpose is served, then I always figure the rule and the law will support that purpose. And he made it come alive. After law school, you started working as a state attorney. Right. Straight from law school to the state attorney's office. Well, uh, better than that, I came as an intern under that program to the state attorney's office. and. They were a little short-handed, and um, so they basically turned over a misdemeanor division to me, a law student. And uh, the first uh, How day... How did that feel? I mean, I guess in the, in the Navy you were used to taking on a lot of responsibility, but I mean, walking in, you don't even have your license yet, and, and sit down and, hi, you're the supervisor of the misdemeanor division. Well, not, not, not the division, you know, there were five judges, so one of those five. But, right. But that was, uh, was mine under direction. But uh, the first day on the job, literally in uh, the county court, I had 19 judge trials. And I didn't know any better. I thought that was just the way the program worked. And I think that Professor Earhart, who ran that program, still uses that today as uh, <laughs> sort of a benchmark. <laughs> um, now you worked your way through the uh, state attorney's office. Uh, were you ever the supervisor of uh, felony or? 
No, I spent time in uh, misdemeanor and then was offered the opportunity of, uh, of going into the so-called felony division, but mainly working with the grand juries in the entire circuit. So for a period of just about five years, I worked with uh, all of the grand juries in the four uh, counties in the first judicial circuit. And that was a very, very enlightening and educational experience. And that gave you a lot of interaction with uh, citizens, I mean, and a lot of citizens over a large area, correct? Absolutely, it sure did. What did you come away with from that experience? Uh, people sometimes want to question uh, a grand jury. You hear the argument about we should do away with it. It's no longer uh, uh, an important tool. It's misused by the prosecutor. Uh, and that uh, those citizens, and I always think about those who say this, because they're citizens too, that could have been chosen at random to be on the grand jury, but they're uh, saying that those citizens are just not very bright, and therefore they simply are the rubber stamp of the prosecutor, and don't think for themselves. It's really rather insulting and demeaning and to the members of grand juries, and is uh, not true. I learned that they're very conscientious, they're very intelligent, uh, they come to an understanding of what the situation is and deal with it as fairly as uh, humanly uh, possible. And what people don't realize in that uh, line of work is the number of times that a grand jury says no, because all they hear about and read about are those that uh, um, end up in prosecutions, and so they say that uh, they just indict anybody the state attorney or the U.S. attorney brings in the room, and that simply is, is not the case. I also learned uh, that uh, U.S. attorneys and state attorneys are not evil people either, as often they're accused of being, because they present the case uh, very fairly and forthright and accept the uh, decision of the grand jury. I can remember no time where uh, I even felt uh, that it was an effort to get someone for whatever reason. It was simply an obligation that they have under their oath to take cases that they believe uh, should be reviewed by the grand jury to the grand jury. Now what was, was your role to take cases to the grand jury? Uh, not really. Um, I don't know that it was a, a defined role, but basically I was the advisor to the grand jury. And I did present many cases to them. On the other hand, uh, the attorney who may have handled the case or worked up the case might come in and actually make the presentation. Uh, but I was there to uh, assist and supervise and advise the, the grand jury. Again, it's important to remember when they decide, there is nobody in that room except them. And me, state attorney, no one because it's decided by them. And uh, under their uh, foreperson and assistant and such, and they make the ultimate decision. Now, I presume, and, 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 and correct me if I'm wrong, that a lot of people when they start their service as grand jurors are uh, reluctant, if not unenthusiastic. Is that a correct presumption? It is, and uh, unfortunately it is with the regular petty or trial jury as well. But having dealt with those people over the years, and I do make uh, uh, an effort to talk to many of the jurors after they serve, I have not yet met a single individual, and I mean that literally, not just to make a point, but literally, who expressed any dissatisfaction after they had served. No, Quite the contrary. They often uh, thank me for not excusing them or they'll tell the tale about how they tried to get out of it, called the clerk, did everything they could. And now they find it to be one of the most satisfying experiences that they've ever had in their life. Well, let me fast forward because I think you have a unique experience and position both with having seen grand juries and with your technique that I was going to get to later but I think now it's the perfect time. After your jury trials you invite the jurors to come talk with you informally and you've had a lot of experience both with the grand juries that you've worked with and 
uh, the petite juries who have done the criminal and civil trials. What have you observed from all this? What, what, what messages do you have for, I mean, this is an historical video series, and I'm not trying to, uh, to blow things out of proportion, but I think your perspective is unique, and I, I really think it'd be important to capture some observations that you have made about the jurors, about the lawyers, about the interaction that you've had that very few people see and very few lawyers really get a chance to see. Well, I think that you, you perhaps are, are correct because I make such an effort to do that and uh, learn a lot. And it's unfortunate, in my opinion, that we let jurors walk away and take this wealth of knowledge that a, attorneys uh, uh, would literally treasure if they had that opportunity. And it's very revealing. I've had them uh, tell me afterwards when some high-flying uh, attorney might have tried the case and gone through all the theatrics and all the fancy footwork and uh, all the slideshows and just everything that, that, that conventional knowledge suggests to some attorneys is so very important. And then to have a juror say that uh, in, in I, I won't say anger, but sort of in, in, in response, would you tell Mr. So-and-so that it was in, uh, in spite of him that we uh, rendered a verdict in favor of his client because we thought it was the thing to do. Uh, if, if that attorney could hear that type of comment, uh, how, how meaningful and revealing uh, it would be. And that happens uh, many times. Now when I talk to them, I'm only there really to, to really thank them to uh, answer any questions they have about the process or the procedure. I never ask about the verdict, that's their business. But often from their comments, you can tell what the discussion was, what it uh, uh, hinged on and such. And it's always amazing uh, when you realize what they felt was important, that you know from uh, watching the trial what the attorney might have thought was important. And some of the cute little things that attorneys do case after case after case are just turnoffs to uh, juries. And, and I'm serious, uh, although I preach a lot about it, I am dead serious, uh, an opening statement. People argue in uh, trial practice and in school and all the seminars you go to that your case is won on opening statement. Of course, that flies in the face of those who say your case is won at jury selection. <laughs> but I can guarantee you that uh, it, it's more likely lost in opening statement if you go on too long. And uh, it's, it's, it's the same admonition I give all attorneys, uh, particularly with regard to closing argument, that uh, few cases are won after 30 minutes, but many are lost. And that's advice that comes from the from the jury. So I, I try to share those. I can't be very pointed and I don't want to, nor do I ever intend to say juror so-and-so said this or that, but I have to couch the comments in general terms to preserve their uh, privacy as well. Now, it, it, it's obvious to me that your enthusiasm for the law and your enthusiasm for your position is, I can't imagine it being higher. I'm wondering if your interaction with the jurors, well, let me, let me just go, go back for a second and, and instead of, I won't ask a leading question, how's that? Where did you get your motivation? What keeps you so enthusiastic? I, I, I guess because I'm a sincere and true believer in, uh, in, the, in the justice system. It is the one thing I think that sets this country apart from all others, certainly today, and if you look in history, from all in world history, that is the single thing that differentiates us, is the rule of law. And uh, once you come to that conclusion, then you, if you care a thing for the country, and uh, your family who lives in that country and the people that are around you, then you just have to be enthusiastic uh, about it because it's just so important and it disturbs me greatly when people don't recognize that and appreciate it and uh, mainly because they have such a, 
uh, a poor understanding of the system and how it works and what it's designed for. But, I mean, you have, you've seen the, the dirty underbelly. You've seen the, the criminals at their worst. You've seen lawyers who have tried all the tricks in the book. Uh, you've seen the frustrations of the bureaucratic systems, both at the state level and the federal level. I mean, it'd be real easy for someone in your position to have sunk into cynicism, uh, yet you haven't. Uh, is it simply that belief that sustains you, or is there something else that has uh, kept you going, kept you so just alive? Well, there is a basic good to it all, and that exists no matter what these little peripheral type uh, events might be. And of course you get to the bottom line is show me something better and then maybe I will be enthused about that. All right. Let's talk about professionalism because I think the, the segue here works quite well. What do you tell the young lawyers who are uh, stuck in the quagmire, uh, the competition, the uh, the demands, the pressures, uh, wh what do you tell them? How do you, how do you get them to keep their eyes on staying professional? That's not an easy task in today's world. Um, but mainly for me, it is simply the recognition of what the uh, intent and the purpose of it all is, and that is justice the proper distribution of happiness, of wealth, of uh, uh, just everything in our society. And uh, if you keep that focused, then all else uh, falls in line. In other words, the, there is a duty to the profession. There's a duty to the client, and there's a duty to the client's cause. And if you maintain that, then the duty to your family and to uh, uh, yourself in the terms of income is going to take care of itself. The problem I have with uh, many attorneys in today's world is that's reversed. The first thing and only thing they look at is the bottom line and then try to maneuver everything else around to, to suit that. It's the reverse, and it just uh, really won't work that way. But the opposite is true. If you have that dedication, that appreciation, that understanding of what you're about, then I, I guarantee the bottom line will take care of itself. In your uh, years and in the work that you've done, have there been any particular individuals who you consider mentors? Oh yes, uh, and of course, uh, I have to start with mother and father. That's a long way back, but they uh, gave, at least looking back, certainly, may not have appreciated at the time when uh, they were insistent on uh, the proper approach to things, uh, but they were great uh, guides, uh, set example, which was easy to follow and appreciate what it was that they were uh, coming from. And uh, then I had a particular uh, teacher in the first and second grade, Sister Pauline. And she was quite uh, insistent on proper uh, learning and proper uh, acting and such. So she sticks out in my mind. Then I had many, many good teachers uh, uh, along the way. And then in the legal profession, um, I really won't mention the attorneys that might get them in trouble, <laughs> but uh, clearly some of the, the judges that were around when I first came, Judge Blanchard, who you know, the chief judge yeah. of this uh, circuit for many, many, many years, uh, Judge Woodrow Melvin was chief judge, and then on the first DCA, all of whom you remember. And uh, many others in the federal court, of course, Judge Arno, he was, he was the ultimate. He, he was the federal court around here for a long time. Centuries. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going that far. <laughs> but but he, he was wonderful. I learned a great deal from, uh, from, from all of those. And uh, 
theirs, for the most part, was a no-nonsense approach. But by the same token, I had adopted the approach, and I can't say where I ever heard it, but sort of put together from those people, and that's be on time and be ready when you get there. And I observed that those who were in those courtrooms got along wonderfully well, and those who weren't thought it was a miserable experience. Well, now that you bring that up, we have to talk about the time that you held yourself in contempt of court. Uh, be on time and be prepared. I was hoping you wouldn't bring that up. Well, I'm sorry, but this is history and we must be honest uh, with history. Um, you actually held yourself in contempt of court. Yes. And if I can ask a leading question, you were uh, visiting with a uh, medical uh, situation and, and they decided to keep you longer than you intended and you were late absolutely positively having nothing to do with your own fault but you still uh, find yourself. That's true and rather than bore you with the details of it I went for an MRI it's supposed to be 45 minutes and it's in that frightening thing that's right down over your face and so I thought the only way I'm going to survive this is to just go ahead and fall asleep which I did. And so when it was all over and they were taking me out and the nurse had said uh, everything went well and looked good, I look up on the wall and there's the clock that, uh, and it started at 7 o'clock in the morning, mind you, because I knew I had to, to be at, in court at uh, 8.30. And so after this, because I was sleeping so soundly, she went through the whole thing, which was a second 45-minute evolution. And so we're out there and it's already 8.40 when I'm looking at this clock. And this was a day of arraignments. The courtroom predictably was packed, people standing around the walls and such. And of course I had established a reputation, rightly or wrongly, that, uh, that, that of timeliness. And while I had never really uh, held attorneys in contempt, uh, I collected any money or anything like that. I certainly was always after them to be on time. And uh, I guess perhaps that's a little military tradition. And so uh, here I am by the time I get from the hospital. It's sometimes after 9 o'clock. And of course the attorneys don't dare leave because they, you know, know this on time thing. And so when I came in I thought uh, in fairness quite frankly, that uh, I would have held them in contempt and uh, taken some appropriate action. And so what's fair for them would be fair for me. So I came in, made my apologies, and simply explained that uh, uh, it was an excuse that I would not accept from attorneys and therefore I wouldn't accept it from myself. And I wrote a check and handed it to the clerk. It was interesting aftermath to all of that. There happened to be an AP reporter in the audience and I remember coming out of court and my secretary said, what have you done? And I didn't know what she was talking about. But she said the phone had been ringing for the, the, you know, this takes, the whole process takes two, three hours. And uh, people were calling from all over wanting to know what this was. He had picked up on it, written the story, put it on the AP wire and it went out all over the world. <laughs> But the, tr the, the best part of the story is that I got uh, letters, calls, copies of newspaper articles. It was on the front page of the Bangkok Times, for example. <laughs> you know, this fool judge finds himself in contempt. Every one of them was, uh, I don't know what words to use, complimentary, if you would, uh, saying, attaboy, that shows them. It seemed like a, a it wasn't intended for that purpose at all. I mean, it was meant for just It's not like you woke up that morning with this plan. Uh, no, no. It was, I slept through this plan. Right, right. But uh, it was uh, rewarding to, to realize that uh, many people felt that something like that was Well, but, but you have a strong worthwhile. belief in right and wrong. I mean, uh, is that fair to say? I suppose that's, that's right, and... Uh, and, and uh, doesn't matter who you are or what you are, uh, where you come from, uh, the rule of law is, is the same. All right, and now. maybe that's just a little silly minor uh, example, but it, it caused me to realize that people out there that, that are yearning for something like that, and this 
maybe just struck their fancy because uh, it was tremendous, the response. Perhaps apocryphal, but you do believe in setting examples not only for yourself, but uh, you have held a juror in contempt for sleeping through trial. Uh, you have held a, uh, a lawyer in contempt for being late and those have made the, the media, and I don't think we really need to go into the details unless you'd like to, but the question I'd like to ask is the, the reputation that you have cultured for yourself, um, not that uh, it was anything that you went out and, you know, hey, I'm gonna create this reputation, but just kind of over time, uh, is something that you have thought through as a useful tool. Is that an accurate statement? Or is I, that just the worst question you've ever heard in an interviewer <laughs> ever asked? You can see I'm not a professional interviewer, can no, you? No, I, I think definitely I understand uh, where you come from. Let, let's put it this way. Uh, the, uh, the reputation is overblown. I hate to put that on tape because I don't want anybody to know that because it has been useful. Well, but and, that's the point I'm driving and, at. And, uh, and therefore, uh, I don't have these problems that seem to erupt in other courts and other courtrooms because of that. I think uh, somewhat of a no-nonsense approach that we're there for a purpose and let's do it in the proper fashion and decorum is, uh, I certainly know is appreciated by jurors because again, I, I do talk to them. In fact, just this last trial, it was kind of funny because one of the jurors said, uh, afterwards said, Judge, do you mind if we ask you a question? And I said, well, no, I'll answer it if I can. Some things I can't. And he said, did you really hold a juror in contempt for <laughs> sleeping? And I sort of winced because I didn't know whether this was good or bad, but I said, yes. And he looked at one of the others and said, see, I told you so, it was worthwhile. He jokingly said they had paired up into, into teams and uh, each one would watch the other. And if they felt they were nodding off or going to sleep, they'd wake up because they didn't want to uh, suffer the wrath, I guess. But actually, it turned into a, a great compliment because they said, and again, that the reputation might be useful, that they did feel energized by it, that it was that important, that they should be listening and, uh, and, and they did. Well, I think the point I'm driving at is the profession as a whole, do you think we can learn anything from uh, what you have learned in terms of building that reputation and sticking with uh, a courtroom that is, is tightly run? I mean, you don't, you don't run it with an iron fist. I mean, I've, I've tried cases with you and I know that there's, you know, you listen and you're very good at listening. Uh, but you're not going to uh, stand up for a lot of uh, shenanigans or playing around or wasting the jury's time. No, they're just expectations and, uh, and uh, people live up to them. And I think perhaps that is where the, uh, the bar is suffering these days, is uh, they've lowered the level of expectation and uh, people will live up to that. And so if they raise the, the, the expectations in terms of ethics and performance and preparation, uh, then most attorneys are good people and they will live up to it. I know the Florida Bar in the last 10 years has been making a concerted effort to raise the level of expectation. Have you seen any effects of that in your courtroom? Well, in, in my short time as a member of the Bar, it, it it has been painful for me to observe uh, some of the uh, actions of attorneys. And I dare say over that period of time, uh, the level of, of searching for the word, because we, we can talk about ethics, but so let me just say ethical performance has been on a slippery slope uh, downhill. When I first came into the bar as a latecomer, and so maybe it is a unique, uh, point of view, but it was simply expected. There was no such uh, term as an ethical lawyer because that all meant the same. You didn't have to call someone an ethical lawyer. If you said he was a lawyer, that meant the lawyer had ethics. 
uh, it was one and the same. And now you hear more than often someone will brag about a particular attorney and say he's an ethical attorney. Well, that's saying the others aren't. And unfortunately, that has uh, uh, been the drift away from that. Uh, brought on, I think, by the change in, uh, in, in the practice of law, that it is uh, not as much a profession as it used to be. It is more a business, and we are selling something. And the bottom line is what governs conduct rather than the professional aspects of the practice of law. And uh, I think we reached a low point a few years back. I am happy to see that there is a great movement in the bar and uh, amongst attorneys to uh, return to that ethical standard of your, if you would. And uh, the, the bar's emphasis on professionalism, uh, led by the Supreme Court level of, of interest. Uh, certainly Justice Harding is a, a major advocate and a wonderful spokesman for the, for the cause. But uh, again, is making an effort and, and I think it's getting to the point again where it's, uh, where it's cool to be ethical. And uh, what we've done is just for, f let it slide and sort of forgotten it. It was an expectation and today it's not. And uh, hopefully that, that is uh, changing with all the emphasis. Because I, I dare say that, that the majority, vast majority, greatest majority, are very ethical, uh, basically. And given the opportunity and uh, the expectation and the belief that the person they're dealing with is going to respond in like fashion, will we'll raise the level of the practice, uh, ethically speaking. Um, so perhaps we've turned the corner? Well, I wouldn't quite say that yet, but we have definitely bottomed out. Uh, that is for certain. And I'm, I'm, I'm uh, very happy and pleased to see the, uh, the effort that is being made. I think the more we talk about it, the more uh, discussion there is, the more that it's on people's mind. Uh, I, I often suggest that, uh, that, that the solution to all this lies within us that we as individuals can make the difference and the only way to make the difference. And I suggest to attorneys that they have to wake up every day and say, what can I do today to advance the uh, uh, profession? Now what about, let's talk about judges for a little bit. You've been a state circuit court judge. Right. You were appointed to that position. Uh, originally. Originally. Had to run happily unopposed on two occasions to keep the job. And then you were appointed to the federal bench, of right. course. Uh, there is a question now uh, as to merit selection versus election of judges at the state court level. Uh, and you've experienced both, uh, both the election system, merit retention system, and uh, the appointment for life. Um, I, I'll ask the silly question, which do you prefer? <laughs> <laughs> that is a silly question. <laughs> no, no question about it. I, I presume the answer is the appointment for life. but Actually, there's, uh, there's really more to it from a substantive perspective. And uh, I'm always a little hesitant to, to become involved in that uh, discussion because I can see people in the state system saying, uh, you know, fed butt out. Uh, but by the same token, I was there, I know how it operates, and I've been here, so I've seen it on, on, on both sides. And uh, it is often argued that if our founding fathers came back to this country today, you know, they flew in off that spacecraft from Mars, and they landed here, and they were driving down the street, and they saw a sign saying, vote for Ross Goodman for judge they would think they were in the wrong country, likely to get back on that and take right off because they know they, they, they mislanded and they were in some foreign land or foreign country or foreign planet because the f they could not conceive of an elected judiciary being free and independent, which is what they believed were necessary to uh, keep the democracy together. 
and uh, clearly the uh, judicial branch is the third leg of that three-legged stool and without it uh, our society as we know it uh, simply can't exist and so a, a, a free and independent absolute independent judiciary uh, is incompatible with an elected uh, judiciary because naturally you have those concerns, uh, whether consciously or unconsciously, as to what decisions mean or don't mean uh, out in the public, who is going to vote for you. And I do know that uh, because I'm retired from the Navy and I had a retirement, I could go home and sit and rock on the front porch. I didn't really need the job. I didn't feel many pressures, even in the elected um, uh, situation. But it's hard for me to imagine a young judge, say 42, 43, something of that nature, who has given up a practice of uh, uh, 15 years, say, and been elected or, or appointed as a, a state court judge, and has that career-defining case that the public is interested in. It gets called every day as to when you're going to render that opinion. The media is calling. The public is here. It's on TV the world over. And you have to render a decision that either will make you the most popular, best judge in this area, guaranteed to be reelected next month, or make you the most despised, hated judge in the area that will get defeated next month. And you got two kids in college, you've given up a practice, you got nowhere to go. Is that going to affect you or not? We like to say not, and we think not, and I do believe as much as humanly possible, no. But by the same token, it, uh, it would be so easy to punt and say, let the DCA take care of that. They're 200 miles away. But then they've got to be elected too. Imagine, the merit retention, uh, imagine system. what Judge Arno would have faced uh, in the 60s. Judge Arno would have lost the next election uh, 99 to 1. The only vote would have been his wife's. <laughs> There's no question about that. In all of the tough major desegregation cases that he felt in this community, it could not and would not have ever been done by a state court judge. I think that is, is, is fair to say. And yet Judge Arno today is revered because of those decisions, both by black and white alike, who recognize uh, how important they were uh, to this community. And so that, that, that's a good uh, situation. I don't know how many know Judge Arno or, or, or those, but I remember a personal one um, uh, was a search warrant in a case of child pornography. And the house that the sheriff served the search warrant on was uh, filled. And I believe the count was some eight or 9,000 uh, pornographic child-type uh, photos. And uh, motion to suppress. And uh, this crazy judge suppressed them. Obvious liberal-type judge. Uh, that would be the media's take on that. And basically, the uh, story in the paper talked just about that. Judge must like pornography because he turned this guy loose. That was the thrust of it. Now, uh, again, I didn't uh, particularly think about it because, as I say, it wasn't uh, my insulation was my retirement. But by the same token, uh, I would not have been elected the next month or two months or three months later. I don't know how long it would take him to forget it. Except happily, when they arrested the person, they found uh, eight uh, child pornography photos in his trunk, and he was convicted and uh, got life. And so then again, I was a hero. But there you go from the, the from the pits to the to the pinnacle, and that that just doesn't work really. And here, um, I have to be faithful to the law. I have to be. Uh, of good behavior, I think the Constitution says, uh, which hopefully is not a great burden. It hasn't been to me. And uh, do simply the best that I can possibly do and uh, with, without, without concern for what it's going to mean to me. The only concern is, is it fair? 
to the litigants, to the public, uh, to the, the system. And uh, that, that's a simple, easy burden. And um, without rendering opinion, I suspect you can guess what it, uh, what it would be. <laughs> be elected or, uh, well, we'll, we'll or, move on or, to another or, subject. How about that? And I might say that that's fueled also by my uh, uh, personal situation. I was appointed by Governor Graham uh, to the state court. I had never met Governor Graham, never seen him. Happily, I did vote for him. <laughs> um, but it was as non-political from my standpoint as it could possibly be. How I got it, you know, I love to say I was the most qualified, at least he thought so, but it wasn't political. And then uh, in this federal appointment uh, through Senator Mack, a similar fashion of having a judicial nominating committee to propose you and you go to interview and they review and such. And uh, I'd never met Senator Mack. Um, again, I did vote for him too. Um, but that was the only political connection there was in, in that one. Yeah, I don't recall you ever being really active in politics in the, uh, in the local area. Or particularly when you were on the bench, you couldn't be. No, certainly not. Uh, but I don't believe at the state attorney level you were... Uh, uh, of course, I don't think you had the time back then. Well, <laughs> that, that's part of it. I, I was involved with some people that I respected and such when they ran and, uh, you know, would offer little background help and such, but no, I never was a political uh, activist in, in, in that sense at all. And so how it happens, I, I, I don't know, except clearly with uh, uh, gov Governor and now Senator Graham and Senator Mack, uh, they don't deal in politics when it comes to the judiciary. I think they do have an understanding and a respect for the fact that it is a lifetime appointment and is therefore that important. And I can guarantee you by the time the FBI takes you apart and the, uh, the, the White House people uh, uh, gut you and then the, the Senate uh, in their wisdom uh, confirms you, uh, they, they've cut you open, laid you on the table and then hopefully <laughs> get you back together in time for the investiture. <laughs> it's quite an experience. Did you learn anything from the experience? I, again, mine, and I know it varies uh, across the country because I understand and hear from other uh, people and other sources how political their appointment was or how so-and-so did this or did that. But my own personal experience, it is a pure uh, system. And, and of course, it's like any system. It's, uh, it's the people that operate the system. Sure. That, that make it work. And we, we've been just fortunate as can be in that regard with Senator Graham and Senator Mack. Now, you had mentioned uh, our founding fathers coming back uh, from Mars and seeing a billboard. Uh, Roscoe had been running for judge. Uh, what about lawyer advertising? What about uh, Ross Goodman, hire me as your attorney? Uh, do you have any views on that and, and what effect that's had on the uh, level of professionalism? Well, I was opposed to uh, advertising when it first came up. Um, but I, I've, I've uh, since modified that uh, view because there is uh, a place out there for advertising that is very tastefully done. And I know you've seen some, we all have. Some of it is uh, informational, uh, just to be sure people understand their rights and such as that. Uh, some people are just saying, you know, basically, if you have a problem, uh, then I would, you know, be the one to help you with it because I've been here for so long and that. I, I think that, I, I've become convinced that that's good, that that serves the public interest. However, uh, if you remember in the early days when we had uh, attorneys uh, literally posing as doctors, chasing in the hospitals, and this was all on TV in their ads, you know, standing by the ambulance with the light going and such. Uh, those were very, very distasteful. And even today, uh, despite all the efforts, we still have some of that out there that is uh, demeaning to the profession. Uh, and one I saw the other day and had to comment on, because I watched them with great interest, 
even today. And this was very responsibly done in the beginning. And, and I was thinking, well, this, this, is, this is a tasteful ad. Until it got to the end of where it's damning certain segments of our um, business world, you know, big business and insurance companies and all that. And I think that just is completely unnecessary. Yeah. There are good people there too. If they mess up, then that's what uh, attorneys are for, is to assist the people to put a, place their valid claim in court. Well, it's, a, it's the sin of prejudice. It's the so it, again, it went from positive to negative, all in a space of about 20 seconds. <laughs> and the end result was that, again, it, it just uh, Left would have taste. to destroy public confidence in, uh, in, in lawyers and, and lawyering. I guess it's, you know, for lawyers to complain about everybody bashing lawyers, uh, what gives them the right to turn around and bash somebody else? Is exactly. And that, that's another one of the, the aspects of today's world and I suppose maybe some of us old timers have to adjust. I hope not. But this is a lawyering on the, on the courthouse steps. And you have the plaintiff's lawyer coming out and accusing the defense lawyer of this and that. And then the very next thing you see is the defense lawyer saying, no, I'm not the jerk, this one is. I mean, that, that serves uh, absolutely no purpose whatsoever. They should practice their trade in, in court and uh, let the jury uh, and the court decide uh, the case. And uh, in most instances, all they're doing is out there uh, getting a little free advertisement, feathering their own nest and saying how great I am. If I lost the case, it's only because of the crooked judge. Uh, you know, that, that serves no purpose for us. <laughs> Happily, that's the minority. But unfortunately, in today's media-oriented world, those are the people that end up on, uh, on TV. Well, let me ask a pointed question uh, in terms of the jurors that you've spoken with. Uh, have you heard any feedback from them? Have you gotten any indication from them that uh, lawyer advertising has had any effect? Uh, I can't say specifically lawyer advertising, but I can tell you that because of what they see in court, uh, in a, in very good performances ethical, dignified, responsible, well-informed, well-prepared presentation, they take note of that as though it's unexpected. Now, if that's a result of lawyer advertising, or at least the way lawyers present themselves to the public in the media's eye, then um, that could well be the case. Let me hand you a magic wand. How would you wave that wand and change the uh, the way that the public perceives the legal profession? Oh, I could <laughs> wave it on the public and say, you know, just, uh, just change your, uh, your view to what it, what it really should be. Because I still think that basically speaking, the greatest majority of the attorneys are uh, making every effort to be uh, ethical, to act responsibly, to represent their client in a proper and a dutiful fashion. Um, and so I wish the public could, could see that and have that attitude that that's the expectation when they go to an attorney or an attorney walks into the room as the reverse now I'm afraid is the case, that the expectations are different. They expect the lawyer in the courtroom to try to finagle and uh, um, hide and cover up and mislead. I think that is the expectation. So it's easy to wave the wand and say what the public should be. The point is how to get to that point, and that would be waving the wand over the the uh, the lawyers. So, so the lawyers walk into the courtroom with the presumption of guilt. I think that's hmm. perhaps not far from the. Uh, from the truth, at least in many of the jurors' eyes as that trial begins. All right, well, I'm taking a ton of your time and I'm thoroughly enjoying this, uh, but let me change subjects here. Uh, heroes, who are your heroes? Heroes, I know you're probably asking from the perspective of the law. No, actually, I'm, I'm not. 
Well, that then makes it very easy because I served with many, many, many heroes. Um, life as a naval aviator is, um, well, for me, it was, it was just sheer joy. But it's not uh, what the average person would think is fun. Um, you know, you're away from home a lot, you're uh, flying on and off the carrier, and whatever weather, whatever. Uh, so that in, its, in and of itself uh, makes for heroes. But then those people that uh, launch day after day in Vietnam, and I got to watch them, uh, many, um, <laughs> I always said maybe perhaps I wasn't smart enough to realize the danger but there were others that, that, that did, they were smarter, and yet they still launched off the end of that ship uh, because of still the old trite words of duty, honor, country, uh, God. Uh, those, those are my heroes. But those trite words are, I mean, meaningful to a great deal to you. Well, that's for sure. Uh, I heard it so eloquently expressed, actually, by Judge Cooter, one of our state court judges. And the subject was jury service. And of course, uh, talking about people who think that they don't want to serve on a jury, they do everything they can to get out of it, and uh, many offer such little uh, trite excuses about, I'm too busy, I don't have time, it's going to cost me money, and such as that. And of course, we're only asking for one day, one trial. That's our system around here. And he said that if he could take those people down to the wall south, which as you know is a half uh, scale model of the actual Vietnam Memorial Wall in Washington, and point to the people that he knew on that wall, and if, if their reflection could come through and those people could stand there, look them right in the eye, and tell them they're too busy, they don't have time for one day of jury service, that he'd excuse them. Well said. Um, is there one quality that you believe every lawyer should have? Integrity, that's simple enough. That's All right. What about one quality that every judge should have? Hmm. Patience. <laughs> Patience for all the lawyers who don't have the first quality. <laughs> no, just, uh, just uh, the, the, the real understanding that uh, people uh, come to court, it's their first experience. They're looking for, uh, for justice as they um, seek it. They want their day in court. They, they need their say. That's what the court is for. It's just so important in a democracy that we provide a peaceful place for citizens to come and resolve the differences between themselves and between themselves and the government. Uh, that's what separates us from other countries and keeps anarchy uh, at bay. And that is just uh, so important for us. And when people leave the courtroom, they have to have the feeling that at least they had their say, they had their day, they had a fair hearing. And uh, while they might not like the result, uh, they can't go away with some feeling that it was tainted in some fashion, either by attorneys or uh, by the judge, that it was fair and uh, honest, and uh, they'd be, they are, they are, generally speaking, very receptive when they leave with that feeling. Let me ask you about your law, law clerks, federal court law clerks. Um, the role that they play, or particularly your law clerks, the roles that they have played, uh, has it been a symbiotic relationship that they've learned a lot from you, but you've learned from them? 
Uh, certainly uh, works both ways. Uh, I make now the follow-up question is how. <laughs> I make every effort to uh, give them a great deal of, uh, of uh, say, authority, if you would. Um, I encourage open discussion between them and the attorneys with regard to procedure and scheduling and process, not about case, that's for sure, and they certainly respect that, both sides for that matter, um, because it works easier that way. Uh, we can get things done. So I think uh, one thing that enables them to uh, begin to uh, have some sort of exchange and understanding of attorneys, how they work, what their problems are, and why we should schedule it this week or next week or whatever. So in that sense, uh, I, I hope it's beneficial to them. That also makes life better for me too when it, uh, when it works that way. Um, what I learned from them is the latest cutting edge uh, technology and take on the law because uh, coming right from law school, they know all of the recent uh, uh, Supreme Court statements and cases and so when we discuss a case originally when it first comes in and we're trying to get a grip on it and such, uh, they oftentimes can uh, steer me to something that, uh, oh judge, do you remember, you know, last year this case was decided and this uh, uh, might be applicable here. I say, well, yes, I'm sure I read it in the advance sheets, but you know, when you read hundreds, thousands even, as you know, you can't remember each and every one of them. So in that sense, they keep me uh, uh, on the up and up and, and, and educate. And that, that, I think, is their primary role, is to educate the judge in uh, aspects mm. of particular areas of the law. That Do you have a particular approach that you take in working with your law clerks, a philosophy, a guiding uh, principle? Oh, one little thing they enjoy is I don't do a great deal of editing. <laughs> and when I say that, I don't think, well, with certainty, nothing goes out of this office that I don't approve of uh, word for word. In other words, it, it is representative of my decision, uh, considered decision, right or wrong. Um, and, and in that sense, it's, it's, it's mine. But on the other hand, I don't necessarily fight over the style of presentation. And I would suggest that if anyone were interested, that they could take any case that's gone out of here and study it very carefully, and they could determine which law clerk assisted me in, in uh, creating that uh, opinion, because the styles differ and such. And I know other judges that, uh, that uh, care a great deal about style and technique perhaps and think they're writing for the ages and so they will uh, edit, re-edit and such. And my only interest, if it says what I want then uh, the choice of words doesn't mean a great deal to me. Is there anything you have to get your uh, young law clerks to unlearn from law school? Uh, I don't think so directly in this, uh, in, in, in operating with me. Uh, however, there are many things to unlearn uh, from uh, law school, and I don't mean that in a critical sense. But for example, you see it in attorneys that come to uh, court, and an attorney will ask uh, what is technically and obviously a leading question, and they'll jump up and object. And um, of course, you know, do you sustain the objection? First of all, it's a meaningless objection because it, it's not on any particular uh, element of the offense, so it's not important. It might just be a preliminary type thing. But they come from law school so wired <laughs> to, it's a leading question object, without listening to the question and making a determination, does it affect me and my case? And if it doesn't, who cares if it's leading? And so my advice is always that, uh, go into the case with the idea that you're never going to object. And I love a case, with, and I, I've, we had one, uh, been maybe six months now, two good attorneys, again, I'm not going to mention names, but there was one objection in the entire trial for two days, one objection. 
And I thought the jury left with the perfect opportunity to come with a fair decision because they had received the entire case without any um, jumping up and down or interruption or whatever. And because it wasn't hurting uh, anything. And so little things like that, and that's understandable now, because that they're taught in school, you know, hey, that's rule so-and-so, that's an objection, object. All right, but uh, let's, let's go back to that case six, six months or so ago. The, was it the relationship between the lawyers? Was it the quality of the lawyers? I mean, what, what magic led to uh, two lawyers trying a case so cleanly? Good ethical lawyers. Period. One is not trying to put something over on the other, so what is there to object to? And vice versa. And so, if it's a leading question to get to the point real quick without wasting the time, then this attorney, that's exactly what he wants as well instead of just saying, hey, that's leading, I'll object. Uh, it's that simple, quite simple. How do attorneys, oh, let me strike that question, if there's some formal way of doing that. How, <laughs> motion to strike. Granted. <laughs> Bailiff, shoot that question. Um, is there any way to shortcut to getting lawyers that perspective, that understanding, that let's fight over what we really disagree and, and the rest let's work together because there's no reason not to. That again back, gets back to what we've touched on here uh, several times uh, today. Uh, for example, in family court, in state court, um, many people perceive that they want to go get the most obnoxious lawyer that's going to fight, knock down, drag out because they want to get even with the person, the, the husband or wife on the other side. And so they, they seek out these attorneys that are known to be this type of, uh, of, of attorney without looking at the result. What, what is the result of this? And uh, so then I think the attorney thinks that's the expectation. I've got to fight for this person. And so I go in there and just tear them up. Just, uh, uh, it, it just is sad to watch that uh, uh, type of approach. The question uh, I'm trying to ask is a, a pragmatic one. How, how, is there some way to teach that in the law schools? Is there some way the bar can instill that? Is there something judges can do that can just get lawyers to that understanding or they simply have to go through the experiences and just hopefully learn from those experiences? Well again, what I think is going on now, that people talk and are concerned in this area and I think if those type of attorneys would stop and, and realize, even if they're concerned with the bottom line, that they're going to do better with the reputation of winning and uh, of course they think a win is because they've been this way and if they could come to the understanding that they would win more uh, in the long run by being uh, proper in their demeanor and their approach and uh, present the case in a responsible way, uh, then if they're concerned with the bottom line they would have to adopt that approach. And so I think it is a matter of education and when I say that, again, I'm not faulting the law schools, but if there is a failing in the law school, uh, it is just that, that they teach too specifically instead of the broader uh, aspect of, uh, of the profession. Uh, for example, if every law school and every class could integrate an ethical aspect to it, and what I mean by that is, uh, in, in talking about evidence. Don't just say what the rule is, uh, how it's applied and how it works, and, uh, uh, but talk as much about what it's for, what it's designed, what its intent is, and then offer some ethical discussion. Like you're faced, you've got this particular uh, letter in your hand. Technically speaking under the rule, it may not be discoverable. Do you withhold it or do you take the 
more open approach and say it may be discoverable, so I, I, I give it to them and let them have it. I'm not saying that the professor has to offer even an, uh, a final opinion, and that, of course, wouldn't be on the final exam either, but it would cause people to discuss and reflect on the ethical aspects uh, of the rule, and that can be done in every single class, whether that be evidence, torts, whatever, uh, and I think that might help at least focus, get people to thinking in that, uh, in that area. Have you any other suggestions that might uh, improve law schools? Well, I am a true believer in the uh, internship programs, the practical aspects uh, of, uh, of lawyering, and I think that you can go through law school without ever touching on that, without having uh, any introduction to that. Uh, fortunately for me, I kind of knew what I wanted to do. Uh, and therefore I took all of these type of courses and I felt rather well prepared when I came out. But those were all optional courses for the most part. And so you could weave your way through into a particular special uh, area and never touch on that. Like, where is the courthouse? <laughs> you know, how do you get there? I mean, that's a little silly, but it makes, uh, it makes the, the point. No, it's quite, I mean, when I, uh was a summer clerk, the first thing they did on my first day was to take me to the courthouse. Well, that leads to the new uh, uh, program in, in offering and uh, such that the bar is engaged in. That's the mentoring program. Similar, I'm not familiar enough with the ins and outs or how it's proposed to work or operate, but the concept is, is there. It, just, just think to, uh, to the medical profession. Lawyers make decisions every day that will affect a person's life and livelihood that are just as important as the medical doctor. And yet, they don't turn medical doctors loose without an internship. And yet we do. And when you, when you view it in that regard, then the mentoring program is really just a very small step uh, in, the, in that uh, progression. Oh, we'll see. Speaking about we'll see, uh, the future. How do you view the future in the legal profession? What changes do you foresee? Well, I suggest we're at the crossroads now. And so it's hard to see where it's going to ultimately end up. I certainly have my hopes, expectations, and, uh, and, and prayer uh, as to where we will end up. Uh, but it is the crossroads, as I suggested. I think from what I observed that perhaps we've reached the bottom in terms of, uh, of ethics. And I mean, uh, in one sense, how could things get worse? Hmm. Um, and so I'm hopeful that that's on the upswing. And uh, I just have a belief, uh, a, a sincere optimism, I suppose, that uh, truth, justice, and the American way will win. And lawyers are very much representative of that in our society. And so if I give up on lawyers, then I'm pretty well, in my opinion, giving up on this country and uh, what it stands for. And therefore, I have to say that we're going to come out of it uh, all right. Well, thank you. Let me, uh, and I know judges hate it when lawyers say one more question, but uh, so I've gotten in the habit of saying one last question area. So I'm not going to promise this doesn't lead me to ask more questions, but when I'm working with witnesses, a technique I like to use is what question have I not asked? What question do you think I need to ask? What question, what information did I not get out of you that you think is important? I want to ask you that question and, and just make it as, as broad as possible. Uh, you know, we're, who knows exactly what will be done with this video series, but the whole purpose is uh, to take people who have demonstrated uh, 
a, a dedication to the profession and, and certainly skill in the profession um, and ask them about their past, uh, hopefully to create uh, a useful set of materials for the future. Uh, as they say, he who does not learn from the past is doomed to repeat it. So what have I not asked? What, what do you think needs to be said? <laughs> that is one of those uh, uh, far-ranging uh, questions that's not hard to give an easy, uh, focused, clarifying answer to. I think that education is the whole answer. Not, not, I'm not just speaking of, of law school, but I'm talking about the, the public uh, as well. Because I think, I think sincerely that our system is so good, it is so right, that anyone that understands uh, about it uh, will become a believer. And if you are a believer in the system, then you have respect for it and what it does. And that's the important aspect uh, of it all. Uh, case in point, and I mentioned that I had worked with grand juries for so many years. And yet I hear daily uh, in the media, call-in talk shows, uh, and even those that respond and, uh, on national TV that obviously have a misunderstanding of what the grand jury process is all about. And I've always thought that if someone could sit right beside them and say, oh, but did you know that it is designed to test the government's case and therefore defendants and defense attorneys have no role in the design process of the grand jury system. Then how could they be critical when they say, oh, they wouldn't let the, the defense attorney in there? Well, you have to go back in history to understand that the grand jury was designed as the buffer between the king and the people. So you couldn't come and knock down your door in the middle of the night, drag you away, throw you in the dungeon, and, uh, and there you're forgotten. That uh, if you remember with the Magna Carta and those type of uh, uh, legal progressions, uh, they created this group that later became the grand jury that the king had to go to and say, we've got this amount of evidence against this person. Can I go get him? And the people being fair and understanding and uh, protective of their own uh, system says, yes, you should go get him. He's a crook. Uh, and that's the design purpose of it. And that's what it serves today is to test the government's case simply to see that there's enough evidence to warrant having a trial. They make no determination of guilt or innocence or anything else. And that's... Uh, when that is understood, then most people say, hey, yeah, well, that isn't so bad. That, in fact, that's not a bad idea to operate that way. And then when you point out that this is the only country on the face of the earth that its government, and I'm talking about the federal system, cannot charge any citizen with any offense, only the people acting through the grand jury can do that. And no one in this country, the judge, the president, the Congress, no one can find a citizen guilty of that crime except other citizens. Now, if that isn't remarkable in the history of the world, um, it, it, it puts the space program to, to, uh, in a dim light because that is just uh, the light that keeps this country of flame, I suggest, and protects all of us. And you talk about the tyranny of the government, there is no such thing. If the people uh, recognize it, take control through the jury system, and, uh, and maintain the people are in command and control. Now, of course, who they elect to make the laws is another aspect of that. The vote is just as important. But never any place else than in the jury room is democracy practiced. Uh, because think about it, you go to vote for the president, you're one in what, 200 million? 
But you go in that jury room and you cast your vote, you're one of 12. And if you don't agree, then there can be no conviction. Just you, little old you, by yourself. And that, that is democracy. And the whole system is just, just remarkable. When people understand it, think about it, reflect on it, um, then they become true believers as well. Thank you, Judge. It has certainly been an honor. Uh, well, it's been fun. I hope didn't let too many secrets out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid I didn't do my job of pulling out enough secrets. Um, but uh, I think you have uh, given us an insight into, uh, oh, what a trite phrase, but a true believer. Um, I mean, you can see, you can't see it, but you'll see it when you see the videotape. You can see in your eyes the enthusiasm, the, the, uh, the honesty with which you hold these beliefs. And I think, you know, from my perspective, if all the young lawyers, ah, there's a question I meant to ask you. I'm glad we can edit things so we can still have the last question be the last question. People going to law school, and that's who I'm dealing with all the time. What do you tell these kids? They're in college, they're thinking about a legal career. Uh, what do you advise them? What do you tell them? What do you, what do you answer the person who says, I'm thinking about being a, a lawyer, Judge Collier. What do, you, what do you advise me to do? Well, all too often that question has to do with the nitty-gritty of it, like what should I take, what kind of preparations, what am I to expect when I get there, how to, how to get through and such as that. And certainly that is basically important. Uh, yeah, but the, the question I'm after is, okay, why should you want to become a lawyer? There you go. That's what I would try to lead them to um, decide for themselves. Uh, as to what their purpose is, uh, what, what they think is out there, uh, what, what are they planning to achieve, and quite frankly, I tell some of them, you're not going to find that there. You need to go, uh, you know, be an accountant or something of that uh, nature. Although the law is so broad, as you know it, you can generally find your niche anywhere uh, in whatever area uh, uh, that you might be interested in. But by the same token, I think it's so important to look in, in, and have a purpose, a reason, a goal, and not just to get out there and make a lot of money, because that's the poorest excuse in, in the world for ever going to law school. I mean, uh, happily, if you're a good lawyer, that might be the, the ultimate result. But if that's your goal and your sole purpose, your singular purpose, then you should go uh, get into the stock market or something of that uh, sort. Don't waste your time going to, to law school. And so I try to encourage them to, uh, to give those kinds of thoughts uh, some real consideration in determining whether it's for them, whether it's going to benefit them uh, as a person. And as, because uh, if they're not committed, let's face it, then you must be committed to be a lawyer. Uh, in, in the truest sense of the word. You're, you're, not, you're not playing a pun on the word committed, are you? <laughs> <laughs> not yet, but the old definition of professionalism, which is a learned uh, art or, uh, or, or study, but the main component being that of public service. And if you think of it only in terms of dollars, then, then you shouldn't be there. Which leads me, and we'll, we'll, we'll end on this. Public service will turn around into dollars, well, but your own experience, and you've been a public servant all your life. Uh, I like to think so. The dollars, you've never known what you were going to be paid for any position you've taken before you took it. No, we discussed that, as silly as it seems. Uh, that's going into the cadet program. I can look back and say it was $90 a month, but I didn't know that. I didn't even care. Uh, and right or wrong, or good or bad, or uh, silly as it might seem, I always suggest that I have never worked a day in my life because I would have done everything that I've done for free if you would just provide for my family. That's all that uh, was important. And no, I, uh, my father was a doctor and he volunteered, left a good practice uh, in World War II. And, uh, 
It's kind of funny, he volunteered so fast they had not relaxed the standards to get in. And they kept rejecting him because they said he was colorblind. Now, of course, by the time the war really got going, who the heck cared whether you were colorblind or not, you know? And so, but he eventually got himself in as a flight surgeon in the old Army Air Corps. And um, when he got out, though, which is the, the point of the story, he started his practice again with four other doctors who had gone away and come back. Now, naturally, they're way behind the doctors who didn't have to go. But uh, he established his fee schedule back then, which was about 1945. And he, when he retired in the 60s, he never changed it. That's why I didn't inherit a lot of money. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> but it was just that unimportant. And I guess I learned that from him, that what difference did it make? You inherited something more valuable than money. I think so. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Judge. I appreciate you coming, Ross. Enjoy talking to you.